Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome to our service today and our service of service of remembrance. Uh, we're changing the order slightly today in that we've got the young people of CCY uh, with us and they're going to participate in our act of remembrance. So we're actually going to begin with that act of remembrance um, at the end of which they will go out to uh, their, their CCY activities. But thanks to them for participating. Thanks also to David Frith, who's our piper for today, and will we'll pay the, the lament. Um, and before we start, our other notices, uh, the good news that we celebrate today, as you'll see, there's a rose on the communion table here, and that's to celebrate the, the birth of Lewin William Claridge, who was born on the 5th of November this year, to his parents, Rebecca and Matt Claridge, and to his grandparents, Terry and Mary Falkenbury. So congratulations and best wishes to, to, to them. And finally, before we start, a, a word of thanks to Vanessa, who has prepared the tribute again for our act of remembrance. So let us worship God, let us pray. Eternal God, you are the shepherd of our souls, the giver of life everlasting. On this day, when we commemorate and commend to you those who lived and died in the service of others, we are glad to remember that your purposes for us are good, that you gave Christ for the life of the world, and that you lead us by his Holy Spirit into the paths of righteousness and peace. Merciful and faithful God, your purpose is to fold both earth and heaven in a single piece. With sorrow we confess that in our hearts we keep alive the passions and pride that lead to hatred and to war. We are not worthy of your love nor of the sacrifice made by others on our behalf. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O oh, gracious God, grant us the assurance of your forgiveness that we might be freed from these faults and failings of the past. Hear us this day for the peace of the world, for the wise resolution of conflicts, and the release of those who are captive and oppressed people everywhere. Grant that all may do your will and live in your spirit and commit themselves to your peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For our act of remembrance, will the congregation please stand? Let us this day remember the kindness of God and his favor to us at all times. Let us remember this day the courage, devotion to duty and the self-sacrifice of the men and women in the armed forces, the toil, endurance and suffering of those who were not in uniform, the support that came from so many different countries. Let us remember those who were wounded in the fight those who perished in air raids at home, those who fell in battle and are buried at sea or in some corner of a foreign field, and especially those whom we have known and loved, whose place is forever in our hearts. Let us remember those who were our enemies, those whose homes and hearts are as bereft as ours, whose dead lie also in a living tomb of everlasting remembrance. Let us remember those who came back, those whose lives still bear the scars of war, those who lost sight or limbs or reason, those who lost faith in God and hope for humanity. And let us remember the continuing grace of God, 
whose love holds all souls in life, and to whom none is dead, but all are alive forever. I'd invite our young people to come forward to read the poem that they have prepared. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders field. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. The Lament. Silence, we remember.
memory of those who died. May we be better men and women, and in gratitude to God, may we live as those who are not their own, but who are bought with a price. Amen. We sing the hymn, O God our help in ages past. Hear the word of God in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 15 and at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have keep my, kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. What I command you, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. May God bless to us the reading of his word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. A time of music and of reflection.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I've shared with you before one of the strange facts that uh, came out of the First World War and those who lost their lives within it. It's the, it's the story of, of two men. Let me remind you of it and its strangeness in a way. In a beautiful wooded cemetery at the end of a suburban lane in Belgium, the body of John Parr from Finchley in North London rests a few paces from the body of George Edwin Ellison from Leeds. Between their graves there lie seven yards of lawn. And chronologically and metaphorically, the bodies of all the other British soldiers, approximately 800,000 who died in the Great War. And they died alongside six million soldiers on all sides, who died between August 1914 and November 1918. How strange that these two men, buried just yards apart in that lawn, in that well-tended cemetery near Mons, and in a sense the distance between them represented by the, the 800,000 British soldiers, but the six million in total, others from other countries that died in the Great War. I find it difficult on now in Remembrance Sunday just to to know on what to what to focus. As I said, as I said last uh, week, I'd been reading a uh, book given to me by Bill, Bill Mulder there, who we're pleased to see featured in the Gazette this week, um, Madame Foucault's Secret War, the story of the French resistance. And there's lots of illustrations, examples I could take from that book of <coughs> what happened to, to individuals in the resistance. I found it very upsetting, well more than upsetting, horrifying, that at the, as the war was coming to a close and the German army was, was retreating um, from France, that those who were in charge of flushing out and dealing with the resistance, many of whom by this time had been imprisoned, as the war is coming to an end and, and they're retreating, how did they deal with those who were who had been caught, who had been imprisoned. And they dealt, by with them, dealt with them by machining gunning them, taking them out of their cells in significant numbers and just mowing them down. And then, in a sense, even worse, then torching the bodies so that there was nothing left to be identified or, or seen. And Madame Foucault herself, Mademoiselle Foucault, her fiancé was part of that, part of those who, who lost their lives. And, and his body was, was never found. And see, so there are many, many e examples of that one could choose from the, the horrors of war. In case that was the, the Second World War. We've read of the, we've talked of the millions that, were di that died and the horror of the trenches of the First World War. But as I, as I read about the tale of the resistance and, and how it was concluded with the slaughter of these resistance fighters, the question that was, I was struggling with is how do you move on from that? How do you move on? How do you ever again restore peaceful or harmonious relationships with, with those who have represented the, the, the country or the force that, that committed these, these horrors? And yet here we are today, years on, and it's inconceivable, is it not, that in today's world that for example, Germany and France might, might, ever, might ever go to war. The world, the world has, has changed. And it's interesting that uh, also been reading and it's been documented that one of the strange things that since 1945, in relative terms, there has been a substantial peace. Now, you may be feeling, well, wait a minute, what about what happened with the breakup of Yugoslavia and the horrors of all that happened in the Balkans? Or you may be thinking of events like the uh, genocide in Rwanda 
or the ongoing sort of wars in other parts of the world. But the point that was being made in this book was that these are in a sense contained. They're, they're not nations fighting other nations by and large. They're nothing like the scale of the, of the two wars, the Great War and the Second World War. And they're nothing like the scale of the war and violence we read of if you look at history as a whole. I mentioned last week that, that violence is really something that has characterized the history of, of humankind from its very earliest days when those that were to become homo sapiens ourselves exterminated or wiped out, it would seem, the other humanoids that existed at that, at that time. And the continuing history of that is a history of, of conflict, of oppression, of empires, empires invading and destroying other countries, just a dreadful history of violence and of war. And how do you move on? How do you move on from that? And is the peace that we ourselves are presently enjoying, is it something new and lasting? Or in the history of humankind, as I'm talking about since 1945 to the present day, in general terms, is it something that's just very temporary? Now, can we imagine some of the, the horrors of the violence and wars of the past, including the Great War and the Second World War, can we imagine something on that scale recurring in our own times or indeed in the future? And I'm sure some may say, well, there's a tremendous flashpoint between China and, and Taiwan and the, the, the seas, the South China seas. There's a tremendous uh, flashpoint in, the, in Crimea with Russia, Ukraine. Uh, there are still undoubtedly flashpoints, but is it partly the case that because of the, the weaponry, the nuclear weaponry that has, been, that has been created, is it that that by and large keeps the peace? How do, we, how do we move on? And listening to the, the youngsters reading John McRae's poem, let's just, let's just hear it again, and, and especially its, its conclusion. John McRae wrote it the day after a close friend of his was, was killed uh, in the Great War, uh, a Canadian. He was a doctor, in fact, uh, John McRae. And he wrote, he wrote these words as the children read for us. In Flanders' fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that marks our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived Saw sunset glow, felt dawn, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. Though poppies grow in Flanders fields. A poem which was to inspire the poppy as the, as the symbol of remembrance. And yet, how do we interpret the, the lines of that last verse? Take up your quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Now, in a sense, it was used as a, as a recruiting line or, or passage or, or thought. And it was written in the early days of the Great War when there was still, sadly, a, a romanticism attached to it. And those who fought in it had not reached the stage of, of disillusionment and, and horror and the waste of it all. So at that point, as I say, it was, it was very much a kind of, well, keep the, keep the fight going. Take up our quarrel with the foe. But is that something that remains and something that continues? And when the wars are over, like those who fought in the French resistance, how do they, how do they feel with those that were, were the foe? Take up our quarrel with the foe. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields, if ye break faith with us. 
at what point and how how are we able how are we able to to move on does the enmity in a sense continue at what might be seen as a sort of trivial level in a sense I, I can think of friends of my father's generation who said they'll never buy a Japanese car you know and that simply comes out of the obviously the horrors of the of the camps the Japanese prisoner of war camps how do we how do people move on beyond that sort of feelings of of, of enmity we are privileged to live in a sense of with a sense of peace in our in our own time here in this place but like everywhere else there are also there are also tensions there are also not just differences but but divisions and they are legacies of the past and how does one how does one move on last week former president of south africa fw de clerk passed away if you remember, it was the clerk that, in a sense, brought about uh, the end of, of apartheid in South Africa, and that he freed Nelson Mandela and allowed the, the provision of, of other parties, no longer criminalised the ANC, South African Communist Party, and others, and that started the process of the of the end of end of apartheid. And he, along with Nelson Mandela, were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for all that he had done. His legacy was still a, a, a difficult one in a way. His, his relationship with Mandela was, was not always a smooth and a, and a harmonious one. There was a feeling that he did what he did out of a sense of inevitability. He, he could see what was coming and the fact that the apartheid regime was, was unsustainable in the long term. And so rather than out of a sense of conviction, um, he did it because he could see what was coming. And this had, this had to be the way forward, and he was the one, in a sense, who had the courage to, to, to do that. But before his death, I'd been interviewed about, about that and about his relationship with, with Mandela. He simply said that he apologized. He apologized for the terrible horrors of apartheid, for the hurt that they had caused, the oppression that it that created. And he felt he could do no more than that. For those that, he said it was no Damascus experience he had, he said it was just a growing realization. But nonetheless, for those that said he did it simply out of a sense of inevitability, we could remember, remember these words of his, that he reserved, he apologized unreservedly for the wrongs of apartheid and for his part within that. And maybe that's how one begins to move on. And that's why we have prayers of confession in our Sunday worship. That we recognize the wrongs we have done, we acknowledge them, we apologize for them. And it's for others to respond to that. And if that's true of us at an individual level, then it's perhaps true at a, at a wider level in the way that we try and deal and move on from the horrors and the, the wars of the past. As I said last week, you have a choice. It's a choice between a vision of something different or the violence that has marked humankind since its inception. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hymn 712. What shall we pray for those who died, those on whose death our lives relied? Hymn 712.
Let us pray. O God of power and love, bless our country, the life of this island, and the nations of the world. Give this day wisdom and strength to the Queen. Govern those who make the laws. Guide those who direct our common life. And grant that together we may fulfill our service for the welfare of the whole people, for your praise and glory. Bless sailors, soldiers, airmen. Defend them in danger. Give them courage to meet all occasions with discipline and loyalty. So may they serve the cause of justice and peace remembering those who are peacekeepers. And do so to the honor of your name. Bless our young people. May they never see the flames of war or know the depths of cruelty to which men and women can sink. Bless our friends, our families, but bless to those who were our enemies, and those for whom we feel an enmity still. All who suffered or are still suffering from war, and civil war, and violence. Grant that your love may reach out to the wounded, the disabled, those who are mentally distressed, those whose faith has been shaken by what they have seen and endured. And comfort all who mourn the death of loved ones and who miss the comradeship of friends. Bless those who are homeless, those who are refugees, those who are hungry, those who have lost their livelihood or security. Help us to pledge ourselves to comfort, support, and encourage others that all may live in a world where evil and poverty are faced up to, addressed, tackled, done away with, and where human life reflects the radiance of your kingdom. And bless those in authority in every land and give them wisdom to know and courage to do what is right. Encourage those who work for peace who strive to improve international relations, who seek new ways of reconciling different nations, different societies, people of different color, race, and creed. Those who have the power to direct the future and the care of creation itself, this world in which we live, with its wonderful richness and diversity, and which so sadly we as human beings spoil and scar. Bless your church throughout the world. Grant that we who bear your son's name may be instruments of your peace, bringing peace to our homes, our nation, and the greater peace in this your world. And now rejoicing in the communion of saints, we remember those whom you have gathered from the storm of war into the peace of your presence. And give you thanks for those whom we have known and whose memory we treasure. May the example of their devotion inspire us that we may be taught to live by those who learned to die. And at the last grant that we are faithful till death being faithful to death, may receive with them that peace which is your gift and safekeeping through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And there is the opportunity of an offering at each of the doors as you arrive or as you leave, so let us now offer our prayer of dedication. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate our offering 
and the offering of our lives, our time, our talents, our money, praying that they may all be symbols of our commitment to live in your way and to work for the signs and for the growth of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hymn 260, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. <laughs> And now go in peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and all whom you love this day and always.
máme.